All right, well, this evening, uh, we're going to be turning to Genesis chapter 3 as we continue to talk about the covenant of works. Uh, you know, one of the things about the covenant of works that we always need to remember is that Adam, as our federal head, as we talked about before, uh, is responsible to the Lord for all of his actions. He is the one uh, who is at fault for what we're about to read. And we'll talk about why that matters in a second. But let's go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 19. So again, let's go there uh, in the word of the Lord to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman who you gave to me, gave to you with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles... It shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you grant unto us this time and this place in your providence uh, to hear this word read, we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would apply these truths to our heart. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, as we get into chapter 3, one of the things I'm going to say from the outset is I'm not going to talk about verse 15. Now, one of the reasons for that is because verse 15 is not really germane to the covenant of works. Uh, that is the, what we call the proto-evangelion, right? The covenant of grace, right? That's the promise that God is going to send to Redeemer. And we're not quite at that stage yet. Uh, where we need to worry about a redeemer. Now, obviously we are because we <laughs> live, you know, 4,000 some odd years after this, but right, for our purposes, right, we're studying the covenant of works. And one of the things about the covenant of works that we have seen is that God requires perfect obedience to this covenant. Right? The promise we heard uh, you know, a couple weeks ago was, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Right? That was the promise, that was the stipulation, that was the assurance, right? That's one of the reasons why we understand this to be a covenant. Because we spent time talking about what makes up a covenant, right? A covenant is an agreement between two parties, right? And this is an agreement between God and Adam. You know, Adam has agreed by the fact that he was made and set in the garden. 
right? You know, one of the things we talked about is that there is a gracious element to the covenant of works. That doesn't mean it's of grace, but there is a gracious element because God has made a promise to Adam. And is God under any obligation to make promises to his creation? No, right? He's under no obligation to do so. By the virtue of their creation, what are all creatures made to do? To serve the Lord, to worship the Lord, right? And so this covenant is a unique opportunity, if you want to think of it that way, for Adam to gain from his presence in the garden. Right, we talked a little bit about this last week, right? There's a couple options. Either Adam remains in the garden forever, as long as he keeps the covenant, or the covenant of works is a period of probation, and that if he fulfills that uh, time period of probation, right, there is something else that he will receive, right? And of course, we understand that that something else is eternal life, and not just eternal life and the fact that he gets to stay in the garden forever, but he will receive the blessing of what we receive in Jesus Christ, right? That he will gain heavenly eternal life, right? That's what we get in the covenant of grace, right? Eternal life in Christ. However, Adam had the ability under the covenant of works to earn his way into God's favor. Now, the covenant of works says, what does Adam, what, what cannot Adam do? Right? Eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? As long as he stays away from the tree. Now, I want you to pay attention to what I just said. Does God say that he has to stay away from the tree? Does God say he can't touch the tree? No. What is he told not to do? Eat of the tree. And that's an important thing that we'll get into here in a second. Right? That's the only thing Adam cannot do is eat of the tree. As long as he doesn't eat in the tree, he can remain in the garden forever. Right? That is the stipulation of the covenant of works. Now, as we get into chapter 3, right, we have the serpent. Now, who made the serpent? God did, right? The serpent didn't crash land from outer space into the garden, right? He was put there by the Lord. Now, why does God put the serpent in the garden? He's just one of the creatures there. Why? Well, he's one of the creatures there, for sure. But what, what, what is he able to do that creatures aren't normally able to do? Talk, right? You know, and that, we shouldn't be afraid of the fact that the serpent talks, right? Because, you know, this isn't a cartoon, right? This is real life. So the serpent is able to communicate with Eve. And who gave the serpent power to do this? God, right? This is an extraordinary work of the spirit, right? That, that the serpent is able to speak. You know, in a sense, you know, it's almost funny talking about this about a serpent, but a serpent is able to speak in tongues, right? You know, the, he is able to speak in a way that Eve understands. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Harry Potter file, right? But one of the, what, what's one of the unique attributes that Harry Potter has? He can talk to snakes, right? Well, where do you think, where, where do you think she got that idea from? <laughs> well, you know, like all good literature, right, it wasn't made out of thin air, right? So here we have a serpent who can speak, right? And Eve can understand him. Now, the reason why God made a serpent who is able to speak is because what does the Lord do sometimes with his people? He tests them, right? right? We see this with Abraham, right? When Abraham is given a test by the Lord to sacrifice Isaac, Right? We see this with Christ in Matthew chapter 4, the temptations in the, in the wilderness. Right? We see this even in our own life. Right? What does Satan do? He, he deceives right? and he tempts us. Now, who gives Satan the power to tempt? God does, right? And what's the purpose in God allowing Satan to, to, or permitting Satan, is probably a better way to say it, to do what he does. To bring us closer to him. Right, to bring us closer to him, right? That's one of the purposes of God's testing of his people, right? Because it's not as if God is acting capriciously, right? It's not as if God sets the serpent in the garden and says, let's see how this works out, right? 
You know, God is not running an exam here in the garden, right? He's not, you know, kind of you know, bored and he's like, well, they're doing well, but let's see when I introduce this difficulty, right? That's not what's going on at all, right? This is an opportunity for Adam and Eve both to show that they trust in the word of the Lord. And the first thing we see is what does Eve do when the, the serpent tells her, um, you know, it comes to her. Remember what I said a little bit ago about what Adam was told he wasn't allowed to do. That's right. She says they can't touch it. They can't go near it. They can't even look at it, right? So the first thing that Eve does is add to the revealed will of the Lord, right? And why is that a problem? That's right, because we're not supposed to do that, right? You know, both the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Revelation explicitly tell us that we're neither to add to nor take away from what the Lord has revealed. And what's the reason for that? Because what happens when we add to the Word of God? Right? We, we, you know, we're basically telling God that He didn't tell us enough, right? So we need to fill in the blanks. And again, what does that say about God's love for us? It means that he's holding something back. Right? And so Eve here has introduced these extra words. Now, let's think about this a second. Where did Eve hear that they she wasn't supposed to go near or touch it? From Adam. Right? Because what was Adam's responsibility to Eve as the head of the household, as the you know, as the covenant head? Keep an eye on her. Keep an eye on her, right? Well, what's one of the ways he was supposed to keep an eye on? Right, teach her, right? Tell her, disciple her, right? In a real sense. And what is our temptation often when we're teaching somebody? <laughs> right, to add to what we were taught, right? Because, you know, either we think that, well, when I was taught this, they forgot to tell me about this, so I better tell, you know, my trainee that they don't need to do this either, Right? But what happens when we start adding to the rules that our boss gave us? <laughs> the true, you probably end up getting fired, right? But the reality is, is you end up not doing your actual job, right? You start doing something that you are actually supposed to be doing, right? There's all kind of confusion that enters into the process. And, and so Adam has evidently is concerned about Eve's ability to listen or keep the law so she so he adds to the law that she that he has been told right this is the exact same thing the pharisees do right in the gospels right because you know the bible doesn't tell us that we have to wash our hands in order to be holy but what do the pharisees teach everybody you have to wash your hands before you eat you know not because they understood germ theory right but because they believed that to eat was a holy work. And so if you didn't wash your hands, right, you were ritually unclean. But Jesus tells the disciples, no, right? You know, you don't have to ritually wash your hands where you eat, right? Because that's adding to the commandments of God, right? So the, the, the natural kind of movement of the heart of man is to be wiser than God, right? And that's what Adam's done. That's one of the reasons why she responds in the way she does. Now, is it good wisdom if you're not allowed to eat something to stay away from it? Yes, but that's not what God said. Right? We don't put words in God's mouth. You know, but that's what she does. And right, the serpent, as he usually does, right, he deceives by, by, by modifying language as well. Right? Because she, he tells uh, the woman you know, that you, know, you will not surely die. Right? And he's, he's fooling around with that word die. Right? Because when she eats of it, what doesn't happen? She doesn't die, right? Because in, in Satan's telling of it, right, what does death mean? Like instant, you know, ending of breathing, right? So she takes a bite of whatever it is, right? Traditionally, we understand apple. I don't know why, but we an apple. And she looks up and she realizes what has not happened. She didn't die, Right? So she goes to Adam and says, hey, this is pleasurable to eat and desirable to make one wise. And she gave it to her husband. 
Now, what should have Adam done at this point in time? Right, corrected Eve. Right, because who is the covenant head? Who's the federal you know, covenant head? Adam, right? So if Adam had corrected Eve here, there would not have been a fall, right? Sin would not enter into the world, right? Because Adam is the one that God made the covenant with, not Eve, right? That's one of the reasons why we need to be careful about who we blame in this story, right? Because who is responsible for the, the fall? Adam is. Is the devil responsible for the fall? No, he contributed to it, obviously, but it, you know, it's not the devil's fault that we choose to sin. Right? That's our fault, right? And it's Adam's fault that he did this. And again, we, we, it's important we understand this because the more we understand Adam's responsibility here in the covenant, right? When we get into the covenant of grace and we start talking about Jesus Christ and his responsibility, right? We'll better understand why it is that Jesus is only able to fulfill this broken covenant that Adam has broke. Now, you, as we see these things happen, right? We, we see the, 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 the um, events that take place immediately after, right? God comes and sees them and asks a bunch of rhetorical questions and they're not able to answer them and all these things. And then we have the curses that come down. And, and we'll kind of close on this, but notice the three curses, right? Everybody gets one, right? You know, the serpent gets one, Eve gets one, and Adam gets one. Now, one of the reasons for this is that the, uh, the, that the work that's ongoing is that everybody is being punished for their role in this breaking of the covenant, right? But Adam is receiving the lion's share of it, right? So first of all, the serpent is cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, you know, the... You, you, some people look at this and say, well, that means that, you know, the, the serpent, um, you know, must have had legs or something, right? If now it has to crawl on its belly, right? But that's not really the curse. The curse is, what does he have to eat the rest of his life? Dust, dust right? Now, any, any reason why you think why dust might be a part of the punishment? That's what man was made of, right? And what has the devil sought to do, right? Destroy man, right? So in a sense, this is a punishment that fits the crime, right? He sought to, de to devour men, so he's going to spend eternity devouring men, right? The, <coughs> the substance that men was made of. Now, you know, when we understand again that the serpent, serpent is the devil, right? One of the things we remember is that ultimately, where does the devil end up? In hell, Right? alongside all of the souls that he has devoured, right, in this cursed life that he leads, right? And so he is uh, not only, you know, you know, foisted on his own petard, you know, the, the famous example of this, of course, is, uh, is a Haman, you know, who builds the, um, you know, the, with the gallows, I couldn't remember what to call it. The gallows, right, and is hung on the ones that he made, right? Satan is sought to destroy man, and by man he's going to be destroyed, right? And again, that's that's part of the message, Genesis 3.15, but I told you, I want to talk about it. Uh, then to the woman we hear, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain spring for children. Now, you know, why would that be the particular curse that's laid on Eve? Well, I mean, you know, obviously she, you know, you know, she's the one who started everything. But, you know, what is the unique responsibility that God has given to women? To give birth, right? To bear children, right? You know, that's, you know, that, that, that's where Eve gets her name, right? She's the mother of all living. And so the very thing God has made her to do is now cursed, right? So now women have pain in childbirth, right? They have difficulty in childbirth. There is death in childbirth, right? Because of the nature of her judgment. Now, the, the second part there is you shall desire, your desire to be for your husband, right? Now, does that sound like a curse? <laughs> what, what should wives do? Desire their husband, right? But that, that, that's one of these things where 
Uh, we need to think a little bit more deeper about what's being said here. The desire is that she would be over her husband. In other words, that she would be her husband. You know, because what has Eve done here, right? She has brought sin to her husband. Now, who's responsible? Adam, but, right, she has desired to usurp her husband. And so the, the curse here will be rather than there be a sweet comply between husband and wife, you know, part of the effect of that sin is that there will be division and, and you know, trouble in the primary place where there shouldn't be, right? Because in Ephesians chapter 5, what, what are wives called to do? Submit to their husbands, right? But what's difficult? <laughs> Submitting to your husbands, right? Why are we submitting to anybody, right? We all, we all struggle with that, right? But that's where the primary trouble will be, right? Now, to Adam, right, cursed is the ground for your sake, right? So when we experience tornadoes, who should we blame? Adam, right? Because that's what it means here that the ground is cursed. You know, that the ground now is at enmity against us, right? So the earth is trying to destroy us all the time, right? Whether through weather events or whether through, uh, no pun intended there, but whether through, you know, uh, earthquakes, all these things, right? You know, the earth, which was meant to be our home, right? And of course, remember in the garden, what did Adam and I have to worry about? Weeds, he didn't have to worry about droughts, didn't worry about famines, everything would be good. But now, what does Adam have to deal with all the time? Weeds, right? You know, thorns, all these things, right? Because he's battling the earth in a sense, right? Just like with Eve, Right, that there's this battle now between husband and wife where there should have been a sweet compliance. Now there is a battle between man and the earth. And so what do we have to do every year if we want to plant? Right, you have to work the fields, right? You know, when you harvest in the fall, you know, does the ground just stay fallow? No, right? You know, the earth tries to take it back. Even during the winter when nothing's supposed to be growing, right? It's still tries to take it back. So you have to bring the plow back to the ground, right? You have to renew this work every year. And that's part of the curse, right? Now, when Adam planted in the garden before the fall, if he planted a hundred seeds, how many would come up? A hundred, right? Now, how many you got to put in the ground to make sure you get what you really want? More, right? More, right? Because what happens to those seeds? They die, right? Some fall on rocky ground, some get choked, some get burned up, some get eaten, right? All that kind of stuff happens. But that's again because of Adam's sin, because Adam was given the responsibility of covering the earth, right? Of, of subduing the earth. Now the earth's going to subdue him, right? It's, it's been flipped over, and that's part of God's judgment upon him. And not only that, and like I said, we'll, we'll close on this, but notice, you know, how is he going to find work? Sweat of his brow, right? Every time you get dog tired after working in the garden, who can you thank for that? Good old Adam, Good old Adam right? Because before, work should have been pleasurable. Right? Now, we can enjoy work, right? We can do that. But, you know, eventually, what do we not don't want to do anymore? <laughs> right? We don't want to do any more work, right? And that's part of the fall, right? Because we were made to work. That's part of our identity. And you know, not to get into philosophizing, but I think that's part of the problem in this generation, right? Is that, you know, they don't understand work, right? And it's not so much because we love work, right? it's because we understand the importance of work and there's a spiritual aspect of work, right? You know, I don't know about you, but I obviously don't have a job where I work with my hands all the time, I mean, other than like, you know, typing emails and stuff, but you know, when I do physical labor, it does something positive for my mental state, right? And there's been all kinds of studies about this. And part of the reason is, is because God has made us to work. And, but Adam has taken that blessing and it's now a curse for us, right? And so, you know, as, as we get, you know, we'll have one more uh, time in the covenant of works, but it's, it's important to notice again, the way that the curses are, again, equal to what the blessings were supposed to be, right? And that'll be important going forward for why it is we see so much sin and so much damage and so much destruction 
in the world around us, right? Because the world is now at enmity with God, right? And it's going to try to destroy all the good things uh, that God's doing. And we'll go ahead and close on that. But any questions or comments or anything? Yes, right, in, Ro- in Romans chapter 8, right? The earth groans under the weight of sin, right? And one of the things that Jesus is doing and will do in, in the consummation of all things, when he makes all things new, you know, is that, you know, he's going to redeem the earth, right? The earth is going to go back to being the way it should be. You know, it's one of those questions that kids always ask me, right, uh, about animals and heaven. Now, they usually ask me about dogs in heaven, but I usually turn that around because that's, too hard of a question to answer. <laughs> but uh, I used to turn that around and say, yes, there's going to be animals in heaven, right? Because what was in the garden? Animals, right? And who was affected by the fall? All the animals were, right? So it makes sense that the animals are going to benefit just as much from the redeeming work of Christ as we are. Now, obviously, animals don't have souls, right? You know, so they're not redeemed in the same way we are. But they'll experience, again, the same blessing, yeah, I believe, uh, as, as, as human beings do, as part of God's good creation. We'll go ahead and uh, close on that uh, before I open that can of words <laughs> any further. Um, but let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for another blessed evening uh, in your house. And we give thanks again for the time you uh, grant to us to spend time uh, learning more about the way you work and the way that you have worked and the way that you uh, continue to work through your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our hope and our peace, both this day and forevermore. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our benediction today comes to us from Ephesians chapter 6. As we close our time today, again, Ephesians chapter 6 uh, for the benediction, verse 23. And hear the word of the Lord. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.